Thank you, Al, for the, uh, Professor O'Brien, for the uh, kind introduction. It's an honor to be here speaking to college students. You are our future. You probably know this about uh, Professor O'Brien, but uh, if you don't, Professor O'Brien served in the Marine Corps in Vietnam. He uh, served as an elected representative in the legislature in Olympia and served as a police officer in the Seattle Police Department. I can't think of a more distinguished public servant to his country, state, and city than Al O'Brien. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Judges for Justice has been around for, 20, uh, for, for 10 years, since 2013, and we've had success in helping the innocent get out of prison. That said, no one person or organization is ever solely responsible for getting an innocent person out of prison. It takes a bucket brigade. I'd like to recognize some of our Judges for Justice bucket brigade members. They're not here. Well, one of them is. Uh, very important over the last four years, I call him our co-CEO is retired Judge Jay White. Also retired Judges Diane Woolard and Carol Shapira. And big time uh, Bucket Brigade members, Cody Blackburn, Jeremy Miller, Beverly Brooks, Christine Wheelock, and Faraz Zargami, who's uh, uh, videoing, uh, is on the camera today. Thank you all. You're going to see that the most important Bucket Brigade members are the good citizens in communities like Idaho Falls and the Big Island of Hawaii. They are the true heroes. They are the ones that hold elected officials accountable and demand justice. A major theme today is that wrongful convictions are primarily caused by unethical conduct. Today I will discuss some of the cases Judges for Justice has worked on. You will learn <coughs> that <clears throat> unethical conduct in this context of wrongful convictions is called noble cause corruption. I will show you what Judges for Justice calls the five power tools of noble cause corruption. We will look at concepts like tunnel vision, confirmation bias. You'll see that we'll say over and over that a shocking crime starts the whole wrongful conviction process. But the most important takeaway today is learning objectives two and three. Number two, understand that no one is immune from unethical conduct. Fear and pressure are the enemy. And number three, begin today your inoculation plan to react with integrity when in fear or under pressure. In my opinion, your success in life and our society's success is dependent on you acting with integrity. So question, what do you get when you squeeze an orange? Well, the answer is obviously you get orange juice. Next question, what do you get when you get squeezed? When you get pressure put on you? what comes out of you. North America is no stranger to wrongful convictions. In 1692 and 1693, in and around Salem Village, Massachusetts Bay Colony, 150 women and men were charged with being witches. 20 ended up being executed. 15 women and five men. 19 were hanged. These convictions were all wrongful. Unfortunately, in the 330 years since the Salem witch trials, we human beings still fall prey to the subconscious psychological forces that result in wrongful convictions. The National Registry of Exonerations is a website maintained by the University of Michigan Law School. 
as of today, February 23rd, 2023, since 1989, there have been 3,379 exonerations for serious <coughs> felonies. These are people who have been <coughs> found innocent by a judge and released. 136 of the exonerees had been on death row. In the United States, plane crashes are unacceptable. When you have a plane crash, the National Transportation Safety Board uh, <coughs> investigates. The causes of the crash are identified. Changes in equipment, systems, and training are recommended. The goal is to prevent future accidents, make aviation safe. Wrongful convictions are the plane crashes of the criminal justice system. In Canada, their government has determined that wrongful convictions are unacceptable. There are 3,143 counties in the United States, each with their own elected prosecutor. When a county prosecutor has a wrongful conviction, on his or her hands. They have no interest in figuring out how to prevent wrongful convictions in the future. Canada has essentially one federal system of prosecuting crime. In the 1990s, three egregious wrongful convictions surfaced in Canada. Not only did the wrongful conviction destroy an innocent person's life, but also police and prosecutors lost respect and credibility. This was unacceptable. So Canada decided to investigate and find ways to prevent wrongful convictions in the future. In 2004, Canada's Department of Justice <coughs> prosecutors issued a landmark study. It was entitled Report on the Prevention of Miscarriages of Justice. A major finding was, quote, a leading cause of wrongful convictions in Canada and in other countries is tunnel vision and its perverse byproduct of noble cause corruption. We'll discuss both those topics in just a minute, but first let's take a look at the Amanda Knox case. This is the front page of the Seattle Times on March 28, 2015. Italy's highest court had just overturned the murder conviction of Amanda Knox and Raphael Salasciato. Note the second headline, quote, Amanda Knox saga ends in exoneration. Italy has three possible verdicts in a criminal case, guilty and not guilty like we do, but they have a third verdict that's possible, rarely used, and it's innocent. They did not commit the crime. Italy's highest court found Amanda and Raphael innocent. They did not commit the crime. Amanda lived in our West Seattle neighborhood and she was a classmate of my oldest daughter at Seattle Prep High School. They carpooled together for four years. In 2008, I volunteered to help Amanda's family and I got involved. This was the case that sparked my interest in wrongful convictions. These are images of innocent men. Norfolk Four, Central Park Five, Chris Tapp in Idaho, Frank Pauline, Sean and Albert Schweitzer of Hawaii. Each of them was convicted of a brutal crime and rape, even though they did not match the semen DNA from the crime. These are some of the same, but innocent people. Central Park Five, West Memphis Three, Chris Tapp, which is our Idaho case. <clears throat> Each case began with a shocking crime. 
it seems that the more shocking the crime is, the more likely there's going to be a wrongful conviction. Okay, in the lower right there, follow the progression. A shocking crime creates fear in the community. The fear puts pressure on law enforcement <coughs> to solve the crime. Fear and pressure make police susceptible to a powerful subconscious, key here is to remember, it's a subconscious force called tunnel vision. And that leads to noble cause corruption. The Canada report tells us a leading cause of wrongful convictions is tunnel vision. A shocking crime creates fear in each of us and in the community. <clears throat> no American can forget September 11, 2001. This shocking crime, the brutal murder of almost 3,000 Americans created fear across the United States. The fear put pressure on the government to solve the problem, get the bad guys locked up, make our country safe. Despite no evidence of Iraq involvement in the 9-11 attacks, a year and a half after 9-11, in March of 2003, the United States invaded Iraq. Why would we invade a country that had been, that had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks? This is Secretary of State Colin Powell speaking to the United Nations Security Council on February 5th, 2003. He's holding up a vial of anthrax. Colin Powell had been a staunch critic of invading Iraq, but on this day, he made the case that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and that there was solid evidence <clears throat> to support his claim. It turns out Colin Powell was wrong. There were no weapons of mass destruction. But it was his speech that launched the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Colin Powell is one of our nation's most admired, honored, and distinguished public servants. In an interview before he died, he said he regretted more than anything in his life telling the United Nations Security Council that weapons had, that there were weapons of mass destruction. This is proof that none of us are immune from unethical conduct. Even the best among us fall prey to it. A shocking crime creates fear. No one likes the pang of fear. It makes us uncomfortable. We want it to go away. When our fear comes from a heinous crime, we want our police to solve the crime, find the killer, make our community safe again. When the media reports that the police are making little or no progress, there's pressure on law enforcement for results. The fear and pressure for results make the police and prosecutors susceptible, susceptible to tunnel vision. In each of these wrongful convictions, the convicted man did not match the male DNA from the crime. In each case, the prosecutor argued that an unidentified perpetrator whom the defendant refuses to identify left the DNA. Why do we as human beings reject the powerful evidence of DNA and accept an unsupported allegation of another perpetrator? The answer when we are in fear, we are susceptible to a subconscious phenomenon called tunnel vision. The key is to know it's a subconscious force. We don't know it's influencing us. Tunnel vision is not a simple concept. It may sound like it, but it's not. It's also called confirmation bias. When human beings have a problem, they then 
come to an answer, a solution. They subconsciously form a bias for their answer, for their solution. They accept evidence and look for evidence, no matter how flimsy, that confirms their bias, confirmation bias. They reject evidence, no matter how powerful or potent, that is inconsistent with their bias. Example, for those of you who have a car, you once had a transportation problem. You got your car, that was your solution, that was your answer. Now, everywhere you drive around Seattle, you see your car, make, model, and color. You still don't see all those other cars because you are rejecting things that don't confirm your bias. That's a benign form of, of confirmation bias. <clears throat> but when our focus lands on a suspect of a shocking crime, the tunnel vision becomes blinding. We reject powerful evidence like the DNA and accept dubious evidence as proving guilt. <clears throat> the Canada report says that tunnel vision has a perverse byproduct, noble cause corruption. Strong words. We don't like to think of our police as perverse or corrupt. Behind the scenes in a wrongful conviction, is an, an, an investigator that is engaging in the perverse byproduct of noble cause corruption. He is blinded by his tunnel vision. He sees sketchy evidence as proving his suspect is the killer. He ignores powerful evidence of innocence. The investigator does not trust attorneys, judges, or juries to get it right. So he's going to help them get it right. He sees himself as a knight in shining armor on a noble cause to make the community safe and lock up the killer. And he wants to be our hero. Our investigator has an attitude of the end justifies the means. He is going to do everything in his power to convict the SOB, no matter what it takes. He is engaging in noble cause corruption. He sees no problem with bending a few rules if it's going to help a jury to get it right. So how do you get a wrong, how do you get a conviction with little or no evidence? It's what Judges for Justice calls the power tools of noble cause corruption. <clears throat> the law enforcement, <clears throat> law enforcement uses the power tools of noble cause corruption. They are coerced confession, inflammatory media, dubious witnesses, ignore, manipulate, forensics, and official misconduct. The Amanda Knox case, and we have another case in Ohio, and the Chris Tapp case in Idaho had all five of these power tools used. Our case in Hawaii and our case in Pennsylvania had four of these used. So let's talk about our Idaho case. On January 25th, 2013, I met in Idaho Falls with Chris Tapp's attorney. Also present was Carol Dodge, the victim's mother, the mother of victim Angie Dodge. Background, on June 13th, 1996, 18-year-old Angie Dodge was stabbed 14 times in her sleep and sexually assaulted. Shocking, isn't it? Chris Tapp, a friend of Angie's, after three and a half weeks of interrogation, confessed to taking part in the murder. Based upon his confession, Tap was convicted. He was doing 30 years to life for the rape and murder of Angie Dodge. There were a number of red flags. First, his DNA and his accomplice, supposed accomplice DNA, his friend Ben Hobbs, neither of them matched the male DNA at the crime. 
In his confession, Chris Tapp did not know key details of the crime. For example, he didn't even know where Angie lived. In his confession, Tapp says he was at the crime with his friend Ben Hobbs and a third man who left the DNA was the man who left the DNA, but he can't remember that person's name. The Chris Tapp conviction had started with a shocking crime, fear in the community, and pressure on law enforcement. We saw the investigators consumed by tunnel vision that a friend of Chris Tapp's, Ben Hobbs, had killed Angie. The police used all the power tools. During Chris Tapp's polygraph examinations, not in his interrogations, Tapp was coerced, manipulated, and brainwashed into falsely confessing to the crime. The police told Chris Tapp that the polygraph never lies. It has the ability to read Tapp's subconscious and sometimes, and, <clears throat> and sometimes Chris's subconscious would block out his memory. Here is a clip about a minute long of a 27 present 2017 presentation I gave to the King County Council. Our polygraph expert, Dr. Charles Hans, said that the polygraph was used as a psychological rubber hose to beat and coerce tap into confessing. I'm going to show you a couple segments from the January 15, 1997 polygraph of Chris Tapp. In this first one, very short, the police officer is telling Tapp that the polygraph is saying he's at the crime with Ben, and Ben goes wacko and starts killing Angie Dodge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ten seconds later, a very emotional tap, his voice cracking, asked why he can't remember being at the crime. And then the police officer responds to his question by saying, sometimes your subconscious can block it out. Your subconscious That, by the way, is an absurd statement. We remember things that were traumatic. We don't remember things that were untraumatic. Most of us remember where we were when we heard that the 9-11 attacks on New York City. We remember traumatic events. And after he says that, he sums up the polygraph examination by saying, the charts are telling me, Chris, you're telling me, it's saying to me, you were there. The charts are telling me, it's saying to me, you were there. Two days later, Chris Tapp confesses to going to the scene of the crime with Ben Hobbs. On Saturday nights on Channel 7 is a CBS show called 48 Hours. You may have seen it. They did a, a show on this case. Here's a, a segment from 48 Hours. Chris Tapp eventually comes to believe that the polygraph is an all-knowing scientific instrument that can read his subconscious and is telling the machine that he was at the crime. When the police learned that Chris's <laughs> accomplice, Ben Hobbs, does not match the semen DNA from the murder, they turn on Chris Tapp. They get him to think he can avoid the death penalty if he confesses to stabbing Angie Dodge. He needs to protect his own ass. Here's more from 48 Hours. Chris finally says, yes, I stabbed her because Ben threatened me. And then Chris said, the police officer walks over and says, give me your hand, like he passed the polygraph. And that gets Chris Tapp 30 years to life, charged with the death penalty. Ugly stuff. The 
The polygraph videos were the key to getting Chris Tapp out of prison. Those polygraph videos, now new evidence, they're the wedge to get Chris in front of a judge to see the coercion that went on. The polygraphs are the answer to getting him out. And that's what happened. <clears throat> this is a photo of myself, Chris Tapp, and our Judges for Justice videographer, one of them, Faraz Zargami, on the Bonneville County Courthouse steps on March 22nd, 2017, almost six years ago. This was a thrilling moment, and it got better. Two years later, in 2019, using forensic genealogy, the real killer was identified, arrested, and he gave a full confession, which led to Chris Tapp's complete exoneration. Last year, 2022, Chris Tapp reached a settlement with the city of Idaho Falls. They agreed to pay Chris $11.7 million in damages for over 20 years in prison. And the mayor of Idaho Falls officially apologized to Chris Tapp. We'll look at the Hawaii case now. In April 2013, I spoke at the University of Hawaii Law School about the innocence of Amanda Knox. I was sponsored by the Hawaii Innocence Project. <clears throat> this event led me to our next case, the wrongful convictions of three innocent men on the Big Island of Hawaii. It started, as you might imagine, with a shocking crime. The kidnapping, rape, and murder of 23-year-old Dana Ireland in 1991. So one of our videos about this case is called Murder in Hawaii. That's a screenshot. It is a 14-episode documentary about the case. You can find all 14 episodes on our website at judgesforjustice.org. Here is a portion of episode one where we explain the crime. Dana Ireland was intentionally run over while riding her bicycle in 1991. On December 24th, 1991, about 5 p.m., 23-year-old Dana Ireland was riding her bicycle on the Big Island of Hawaii. She was almost to her parents' rental house where the Ireland family was going to have Christmas Eve dinner. A motor vehicle approached her from behind and moved into the left oncoming lane as if to give the cyclist plenty of room. The driver drove past Dana and then stopped in the left oncoming lane. As Dana rode past the stopped vehicle, the driver suddenly accelerated, his tires spinning on the cinder road. He drove into her, crushing the bicycle and dragging her under the vehicle. After being run over, Dana Ireland is taken to a remote location five miles north. We call that crime scene two. There she's partially disrobed, sexually assaulted, and left to die. She's found by a local woman, still alive, taken to the Hilo Hospital. Dana Ireland dies at 12.25 a.m. Christmas morning, 1991. This is an actual crime scene photo from crime scene two. We have put a red box around a blue object. Above the red box, <clears throat> we have inserted a photo of what the object is. It is a blue t-shirt covered in Dana Ireland's blood. It is not her t-shirt. There's no doubt the killer wore that t-shirt. In the interest of time, we're not gonna go into all the ins and outs of how three men came to be wrongfully convicted. Again, please watch our 14 episode uh, documentary on our website. Frank Pauline Jr., Albert Ian Schweitzer, and Sean Schweitzer were eventually convicted of the murder and rape of Dana Ireland. They all three were innocent. So let's, we're gonna right away jump to the good news. On January 24th, literally just about a month ago, 2023, Ian Schweitzer, the last of the three defendants in prison, was, for, was released from prison 
and exonerated. And it gets better. Ten days later, Ian Schweitzer and Amanda Knox shared the stage <clears throat> and spoke at a Hawaii Innocence Project fundraiser in Honolulu on February 2nd, 2013. Let's discuss how Judges for Justice helps get innocent people out of prison. We learned a lot from the Civil Rights Movement and the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. They are the experts on rectifying injustice. In his 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said, quote, Justice Socrates felt it necessary to create a tension in the mind, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help people rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. Judges for Justice is a nonviolent gadfly. We are trying to create the kind of tension in society that will change the status quo, change the court of public opinion. A great fact is this, the overwhelming majority of Americans, well, of the world, are good people. They will not tolerate a wrongful conviction in their midst. So we tell the truth, we educate the community about the injustice through film. Dr. King also said, quote, my friends, I must say to you, we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. Dr. King knew that you can have the law on your side in an obvious unjust situation, but there is no change in the status quo unless you employ nonviolent pressure. You need to create a tension in society that challenges the prevailing mindset. Again, it's 1963, Birmingham, Alabama. This is a photo of a police dog attacking a black kid dressed in his Sunday best. Pictures like this and films showing the mowing down of black children with fire hoses went around the world. The power of film to present truth, to create tension in society and change minds is undeniable. Those 1963 films of the injustice in Birmingham also went directly into the White House and motiv motivated President Kennedy to introduce the Civil Rights Act. This is a screenshot of our first innocence video in our Idaho case, September 2015. There's Faraz's name again. <laughs> uh, in total, we made uh, three innocent videos in Idaho. The films received over 10,000 views on YouTube. We held two public meetings in Idaho Falls that generated media coverage. We advertised our films in the newspaper and on Facebook. We were creating tension in society. The local paper, the Post Register, was a powerful force. Here's one of their editorials. It's headline, free tap now. The prevailing mindset of the community when Judges for Justice first entered Idaho in 2013 was, Chris Tapp is a cold-blooded killer. Lucky he didn't get the death penalty. By creating tension in society, by educating the good people of Idaho Falls through film, in other words, being non-violent gadflies, that Dr. King talked about, we changed the court of public opinion to Chris Tapp is an innocent man, wrongfully convicted. On September 22nd, there was a key hearing at the Bonneville County Courthouse. 
it's hard to see, but look at that photo. It is five people holding up signs like free Chris Tapp. Because of our Judges for Justice work, a local grassroots organization had emerged. This is a photo of five of them before the hearing outside the courthouse. In total, there were 10 of them marching around the courthouse that morning asking that Chris Tapp be freed. When the judge and prosecutor drove into work, they saw these protesters. When the judge walked into the courtroom, it was jam-packed. People had to be turned away. The national media was filming from the jury box. Once you break through a person's tunnel vision and they are no longer blinded, anyone can see that these people are innocent. Three months later, for the first time, the judge ruled in Tapp's favor. Three months after that, Tapp was free. That's Carol Dodge, the victim's mother, and Chris Tapp, March 22nd, 2017. Let's look at our Hawaii case. You're looking at a screenshot of the first innocent video of the <clears throat> that we did in the Hawaii case. It was entitled, Who Killed Dana Ireland? Justice for Dana, part one. The YouTube views now number over 22,000. We look at the number of YouTube views as a gauge. It indicates how many people may be getting our message of innocence. How many people might be changing their minds. This is our second video, episode 11, Catching the Killer. Episode 11 now has over 37,000 views, 95% from the Big Island. The Bar Journal, the Hawaii Bar Journal, goes to every lawyer and judge in Hawaii. And this is one of the three full page ad, color ads that we ran in the Bar Journal to encourage lawyers and judges to watch episode 11. This is some of the most affecting advertising we did. In October of 2020, we sent this six by 11 inch postcard to over 29,000 frequent voter households on the Big Island. Remember, there are 3,143 counties in the U.S., all with an elected prosecutor. The Big Island is one of them. Remember also that the overwhelming majority of citizens are good people. They are honest and they are kind. Good citizens will not tolerate injustice. This Postcard asked frequent voters to watch episode 11 of Murder in Hawaii. It clearly lays out how Dana's killer is still out there. At the end of episode 11, we gave the viewer, the voter, phone numbers of the mayor, police chief, and prosecutor. We asked the voters that if they believed the police should pursue the man who killed Dana Ireland, the man who left his t-shirt and his male DNA at the crime, they should call the politicians and tell them so. We believe hundreds of people have called the elected officials. Prosecutors can and kind of do ignore judges for justice, but they ignore at their peril the good people of the community who see the injustice and oh, by the way, they also vote. If you were a Facebook user on the Big Island, you probably saw this ad asking you to watch episode 11. All told, we have generated about 100,000 views of our innocence videos in Hawaii. When we started, the prevailing mindset in Hawaii was like Idaho. Frank Pauline, Ian Schweitzer, and Sean Schweitzer were cold-blooded killers. Lucky they didn't get the death penalty. Our innocence videos have now changed the court of public opinion. The mindset now is the three men are innocent, wrongfully convicted. When Ian Schweitz Schweitzer was released, on January 24, 2023, the prosecutor got out of the way. 
the judge was on board. It was smooth sailing. Most importantly, the public and press were on board. So when he got out a month ago, there wasn't much fanfare for Judges for Justice. However, this is an, uh, Flynn's Harp is an online publication. Mike Flynn is the former editor and publisher of the Puget Sound Business Journal. <clears throat> After Ian Schweitzer was released, about a week later, he wrote a column. The headline says, quote, Judges for Justice turn court of public opinion in favor of Hawaii man in prison for murder. A resident of the Big Island, Kelly Staskow, read the Flynn's, Flynn's Harp article and agreed with it. This is an email she sent us. Kelly is a lifelong resident of the Big Island and a 31-year employee, employee of the local newspaper, Hawaii Tribune Herald. And she agreed with Mike Flynn about the importance of Judges for Justice. She said, quote, it's true, those telling videos produced by JFJ led the way. Without JFJ paving the way, doubting the conviction, Ian would still be serving time. Thank you, Judge Heavey, for opening our eyes and ears. I'm so glad our current prosecuting attorney and police department have reopened the case and are now looking for the real killer. Thank you, Kelly, for those kind, kind words. That's what we set out to do. But I think the real heroes behind Ian Schweitzer's release are the good people of the Big Island, people like Kelly Staskow. It takes a bucket brigade to get an innocent person out of prison. A person who calls the prosecutor's office and says, hey, go after the real killer, is just as important as what we do. It's a small thing. It was the good citizens of the Big Island, one by one, neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, who carried the message to the Big Island elected officials. The message, Ian Schweitzer is innocent, release him. The real killer is still out there. Go get him. Get to work. So Kelly, if it wasn't for you and the many citizens like you, Ian Schweitzer would still be in prison. Good on you. Mahalo and aloha. Our next Judges for Justice case is out of eastern Pennsylvania, Allentown area. This is a poster for our new documentary entitled, Is Patty Rohr Innocent? Question mark. We believe the answer to that question is yes, definitely. We hope to have our eight episode documentary finished by this fall, 2023. So let's say 10 years from now, wherever you're living, you are aware of a shocking crime fear in the community. A man is arrested. He says his confession was coerced. There's a lot of inflammatory media directed against him. Witnesses against him appear to be of dubious quality. His DNA is not a match to crime DNA. You just might start thinking, this looks like a wrongful conviction waiting to happen. It has all the power tools present. If so, one of our learning objectives today has been met. In the late 1970s, I worked for the Boeing Company and after work one day, I took a three hour CPR course, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Seven years later, 1985, I'm a lawyer in the Hogue Building, downtown Seattle. Uh, a man from down the hall comes running into our office and yells, help, help, Dale's having a heart attack, help. I asked others in the office, did anybody know CPR? No one did. Long story short, I gave Dale CPR and he recovered. I saved his life, or so he said so later. I took the right action under pressure and in fear 
all because I had taken a CPR course seven years earlier. So too, I hope this course today may prepare you for what may lie ahead in your life. No one, most likely, you will face your own moments of truth. Storms of fear and pressure and doubt may come. Begin your inoculation plan today. Plan for a life of integrity, of good character, irrespective of the pressures you face. Hopefully, your acts will lead to truth and justice. And when justice is done, it is quite a thrill. This is an image of Tom Hanks, the actor in the 1991 movie, Philadelphia. Hanks is playing Andrew Beckett, an attorney who was fired from his law firm for being gay and having AIDS. Denzel Washington plays Andrew's lawyer. Here is a scene from the movie. Andrew talks about the thrill of justice being done. All right. Uh, are you a good lawyer, Andrew? I'm an excellent lawyer. What makes you an excellent lawyer? I love the law. I know the law. I excel in practicing. What do you love about the law, Andrew? <laughs> I, many things. Uh, but what I love the most about the law? Yeah. Is that every now and again, not often, but occasionally, you get to be a part of justice being done. And it really is quite a thrill. Yes, it's quite a thrill when uh, justice is being done. And we can all be a part of justice being done, wherever our path in life may take us. As long as we keep our moral compass pointed true north, no matter what storms may, that try to throw us off, our good direction will get us through. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you for listening, and thank you for the privilege of your time. Thank you so much.